Good evening, and welcome to the virtual stage of the Lawrence Family JCC, Jacobs Family Campus. My name is Ryan Isaac. I am the Director of Cultural Arts at the San Diego Center for Jewish Culture. Many of you have grown accustomed to engaging with us through this format, a shift necessitated by the pandemic. Now, in the midst of a global pandemic, our country and community has erupted in anger over issues of race and police brutality. As Jews, we are no strangers to the questions. How could these things happen? How could they be allowed to happen? Two of our pillars at the Lawrence Family JCC are welcoming guests to build community and enhancing our humanity through creative expression. Tonight's event is an opportunity to do both. I would like to welcome those who are attending an LFJCC or San Diego CJC event for the first time. For many of us, spending time together even in this virtual space, provides comfort. For many of us, finding peace in the kitchen is part of how we seek solace and comfort and how we renew our spirits so that we are able to tackle bigger issues directly. Ordinarily, I might continue and say that we are lucky to be joined tonight by Amy Emberling. No doubt that is still true. More appropriate for the time is simply acknowledging and appreciating that we are lucky. Lucky to be where we all are right now. Some of you met Amy Emberling when she was part of Foodies on the Farm a few years ago. She's been gracious enough to return tonight. Over the past few months, I think many have retreated to the kitchen to pass time while sheltered. Amy spends her time in the kitchen professionally, and I'm sure I'm not the only one who could have used her help at some point over the past few months. Amy is the managing partner of Zingerman's Bakehouse in Ann Arbor, Michigan. She's been baking since childhood, is well-traveled and even better educated, and she joins us tonight to discuss baking with freshly milled grains and to answer some of our questions. Amy, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, please tell us how, how are you doing in, in Ann Arbor, in Michigan? How's, how are you personally and how's, how's business? Hi, Ryan. Thanks for having me and hello to everybody. Thank you for joining tonight. Uh, I am doing well in Ann Arbor. Uh, it's a strange time here as it is, I'm sure, for all of you. Uh, at the moment, we're getting ready to open up the state uh, quite a bit starting next Monday. And so we're going through um, a lot of conversations about how to change our business and uh, what we can do to make sure that our customers and our staff can be safe uh, in the sort of the new, the next step of opening. So uh, yeah, things are pretty good here in Ann Arbor as, uh, considering what's going on. Have you been doing any, any baking, doing anything differently during, uh, during the, the closures, during the impact, you know, throughout the impact of coronavirus, or is it just business as usual for you? For me personally, I have been doing a lot of cooking. So if uh, some of you have been doing a lot of cooking or baking at home, I have also been enjoying that. I have actually really enjoyed the fact that we can't go out to restaurants. I love restaurants. I've been going to restaurants since I was a little child but it has been uh, sort of an interesting reprieve from that. And uh, what you might be particularly interesting to this crowd is I've been spending a lot of time cooking from the book by Michael Solomonov called Zaha. If you don't know that book, I highly recommend it. I think he's an excellent chef and the recipes are really, really great. So I've been making a lot of um, Israeli and other Middle Eastern food during this time. I sort of feel like I, I have to stop cooking a little bit. I've been cooking so much that um, uh, I'm not reading any books. <laughs> I'm going to put a little moratorium on spending time in the kitchen and trying to get myself to do something, uh, something else for a little while. I haven't been baking at home a lot. I just really, I have just come up with a couple of recipes that I want to try out, uh, but I've definitely been cooking. It's great. I, I noticed a few people taking notes once you started mentioning the cookbooks and just to let everybody know, feel free, take your, take your own notes. We will uh, keep a list running of, of anything that Amy mentions tonight that might be of interest to, to anyone. And that will go out in a post event email, um, hopefully sometime tomorrow. A Amy, what, what out of that cookbook have you liked? What's, what do you recommend? Well, most recently on Saturday, I made a really interesting soup that he was calling sort of a Jewish Persian matzo ball soup. And it ha it's a chicken soup that has turmeric and saffron in the broth. 
and chickpeas. And then you make dumplings out of ground chicken and they have, it has, um, it has chickpea flour in the dumplings. So it was very, very satisfying um, and flavorful and not uh, particularly complicated to make. So that was one of the most recent things from his book. From another book, if you're interested, called Zaitun, Z-A-I-T-O-U-N. It's actually cooking from the Gaza Strip. I made a, uh, a recipe called makluba. It's a very common Palestinian dish. It's a layered dish that you then that that has rice on the top, and then you turn it upside over when after you're finished cooking it. And uh, this is a vegetarian version. It was really, really, um, it was really delicious. So I had to make it about three days later because I wanted to see if I could make it just a little bit better. A little, <laughs> and uh, so I think it will definitely become a standard for us. So if you're, and then I'm I'm just looking through this book called Shuk, um, and uh, I, I hope to make, a, I haven't chosen anything yet, but I think I'll make something this weekend from that. So it sounds like even though you spend your time in the, in the kitchen or in the bakery professionally, that it's still a, a retreat for you at home. It is, and I'd say probably cooking more than uh, baking at home. Uh, it definitely is. And you, you know, I was thinking about, you know, why is it, why are so many of us cooking or baking at home right now? What is comforting about it? And uh, I, of course, I don't know because I'm not a sociologist or a psychologist, but I wondered if it, some of it had to do with uh, having more control. It's a very confined sort of activity and we get to have a lot of impact on it while the rest of our world is, is out of our control. Um, I think it can be really uh, comforting because there's a beginning, a middle and an end to making the food. And then, of course, it's uh, it can be so nourishing and nurturing to other people. So, you know, I'm kind of wondering if those are some of the things that are drawing all of us into it. For, and for me personally, I can get into that sort of flow state where it's just a pleasant experience. And uh, that is probably a, a, a big relief for me and maybe other people. And it's, it's definitely been a, it's been a big thing for the last eight weeks. It's really been a lot of fun. Do you think it's also also has something to do with the fact that it's a shared experience, even while we're separated, that we all eat bread, we all, or many of us at least, find comfort in in the same breads and cookies, and just the ability to to bond over that. It's, it seems like the last couple of months have been the era of the sourdough starter. Yeah. So that the whole, everybody baking or so many people baking has been really fascinating to me on a professional level because I'm some, I'm sure many of you know that before this pandemic, I would say that carbohydrates, bread in particular, uh, were not entirely cherished in our world. We're maybe sort of a, considered not a good thing to eat or a, you know, a guilty pleasure. Uh, and so it's been very fascinating that so many people turn to it relatively quickly and are very, in, you know, interested in making their own starter and making natural leavened bread. So it's been, it's been nice to see, and it's been really great to have so many, uh, so such a large group of people who are interested in doing something that many of us at the bakery have been passionate about for a long, uh, a long time. I wonder if people have turned to bread because it does uh, really have a, a sort of nurturing and, and safe kind of feel about it. And, you know, perhaps, perhaps that's what it's about. Uh, and I think people have a, had a lot of fun sharing on social media about their starter, how to do it, how, um, what makes it so difficult, what's really going on. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun to watch. I'm guessing nobody at the bakehouse is particularly threatened by any of this, though. Um, no, I think, uh, you know, we have our own little baking school. And I, what we've learned over the years is that the more people know, actually, the more they appreciate what other people are doing. And the more educated everybody is, I think the better baked things that people really want and sort of require uh, of, of uh, bakers in their life. And so it's, it's generally a positive thing. Another really interesting thing that happened because of this and so much baking and because the supply chain wasn't ready for it is that people started calling us and wanting to buy flour, which, you know, we didn't sell a lot of flour before this, but suddenly we were selling literally a one to 2000 pounds of flour in a week packaged in little two pound bags. So we had to figure out how to do that in a way that, you know, wasn't 
overly time consuming and people couldn't get yeast either. So I don't know if, if you had realized or have you read why this was happening or why there were shortages. And it was because so many of us were not baking at home that the millers were not really prepared for this level of demand of flour in uh, consumer level packaging. So there was no problem with the, the supply of flour in the country. We never had any problem getting flour for the bakery. It's just that the millers didn't have the packaging available to meet the demand uh, in the grocery store. So that's, that was interesting. And we uh, mill some of our own grain at the bakery. And we had already started packaging that and selling it in our own little store, but on a very small level. But suddenly people were interested in using those grains too. So it, it sort of became a much bigger part of our world in the last couple of months, which I'm excited about. And you know, we hope to continue to educate and share that with people going forward. I find that fascinating, Amy, and we've had a number of conversations with filmmakers and the film industry is also, like m most industries are all has you know, been disrupted during, during COVID. I know you have, uh, you have an MBA, you've got a business background. What kind of opportunity did, did this present for you for the, for the bakehouse and how did you, how did you manage to distribute 2000 pounds of flour in, in a week? Well, we, we uh, have our own shop, but we're also mainly a wholesale bakery. So we have a lot of wholesale customers. And so it just went out on our normal distribution. So it was local? It was local. Okay. Yeah, it was local. We do, one of the sister businesses of Zingerman's is Zingerman's Mail Order that ships uh, to consumers all over the country. And so they are also shipping flour to anyone who had bought it from their site. Uh, but yeah, that, that this was a major disruption in sort of what was going on. People calling us for yeast because they couldn't get yeast. Other restaurants calling us for yeast because they couldn't get yeast. So that was all very interesting. Um, the other thing that happened that was, I think, great that I'm super excited about was that we started teaching our baking classes online. So people had asked us to do this in years past and we thought, oh, you know, it can't be the same experience and how are we going to teach when people are not in the same space with us because all of our classes are hands-on. But in this situation, you know, we really didn't have much choice and uh, people wanted the connection and they, uh, so many people were baking, they wanted the instruction. So we thought, okay, well, we'll, we'll try it. And I have to say, it's been so rewarding because we realized that it allowed for things that our uh, classes, our in-person classes hadn't allowed. Um, first of all, there are people who sometimes want to come to our classes who have uh, different disabilities or, you know, maybe they're just older and it's difficult for them to do some of the baking on their own. They need a little bit of help or maybe they don't want to drive to our school or they don't want to come. Yeah, they don't want to drive these long distances. And so now they can do it in their home. And so if they had some kind of disability, their home kitchens are set up to work for them and now they can actually take the class. Also, I, you know, our classes are relatively expensive, but when we do a virtual class, we could charge a lot less money. So it really democratized the classes. So for those couple of reasons, I was super excited. The other thing that we found out is that people actually learned better when they were in their own home because they were using their own tools and they were in the context that they were going to repeat this in and they could ask us questions about, oh, their oven or would this cookie pan work or was this whisk okay? Cause it was the only one they had. And then we could immediately help them with that. And so I think the ability for people to repeat what we did in the class is really going to uh, increase. So we're going to continue to do these classes long after the pandemic is over because I think it, um, they have a real benefit uh, to the community and uh, they, they are allowing us to kind of reach our mission in a way that the hands-on classes uh, were not able to. So we'll do both. Incredible. A couple of new dynamics to the business during this time. And Absolutely. Have you been able to gauge how many new customers you brought in through these programs, through the online cooking classes? You know, Ryan, that is an excellent question, and I have not taken the time um, to do that, but I will say that in these online classes, there's often only, there can be 12 people in a class, so we haven't expanded it, be, you know, beyond just because it can be virtual, because we want to really be able to help people, but often there are only a couple of people from Michigan. So there's, could, one day there was someone from Florida, there was someone from DC, there was someone from Colorado, there was someone from Arkansas, 
And many times people say, you know, I always wanted to come to your class, but I couldn't make it to Ann Arbor. And now they have the opportunity. So um, I think a lot of those customers are obviously new attendees. I actually got a comment in the chat um, from a couple of people who have attended the classes. Uh, one person, Elisa Connolly, checked in and said she's a new customer and she's taken three classes already oh. and registered for three more. Oh, wow. Well, thank you. That's so nice. So, yeah, well, that's great. It's uh, fun. Another question just came in and it's relevant to what you're discussing. So I'll, I'll present it now from Maxine Endy. She wants to know if you make your starter first and then use it for your class. So uh, we haven't done any of the Naturally Leavened classes online yet. We're planning on doing one in the first week of July where we'll have something every day for about seven days because we've learned from listening to people and seeing uh, conversations online that people really struggle. You know, is this what it's supposed to look like on the second day? Is this what it's supposed to look like on the third day? So in that class, we will actually make the starter. And then on the final day, people will uh, make a loaf of bread with it. Fantastic. A uh, couple of other questions that just happened to come through and while while we're hot, we'll stick with them. Uh, in terms of subject matter for your classes, which ones work the best? Um, I would say, you know, practically any pastry class works well. The classes that are difficult are the bread classes because if, for any of you who have made much bread, a lot of what happens in, a, in making bread is elapsed time. You need to be patient. And so it's very, a little bit difficult to do the scheduling with online classes. We, you have to do them sort of over two days. So I, they lend themselves a little less well um, to doing online classes, but pretty much anything else uh, works perfectly well. And the bread does in terms of teaching it, it's just a, the scheduling, it can be a little more complicated. I'm gonna get back to one of the, the big topics for tonight in terms of the freshly milled grains. And you mentioned earlier on about how carbohydrates and bread uh, became very, I don't you know, became kind of culturally faux pas for a while oh, and, uh -huh. and steered away from, can you talk about the, the benefits of, of how you're making the bread and, and what goes into it and, and how that differs from what's on the, on the grocery store shelves? Sure. So there are a couple of things. There's the process of making the bread that's different than a lot of bread we buy in grocery stores. And then there's the actual grains that are in the bread. So let's just start with um, freshly milled grains and whole grains and even more processed, but as long as it's organic um, flour. So at the very, very beginning of the bakery, you know, more than you know, now it's like 27, almost 28 years ago, we it was considered sort of uh, cutting edge to use unbleached flour and unbromated flour. So I still highly recommend that as the basis. So bleaching is just a process that makes flour whiter. And, you know, our desire to, you know, it's very sort of uh, of the moment to talk about this, our desire to make things whiter really had to do with cultural ideas of what's better, uh, what's more elite. And so we would bleach the food, so we bleach the flour. It does absolutely nothing good for the flour. Uh, there's no reason to do it. Uh, and so I would never buy flour that's bleached. Then bromation. Bromation is a process that ages flour. So bakers had the idea that you needed to age flour in order for it to uh, sort of activate properly when you're making bread. And aging uh, naturally takes about three weeks. So in our American way, time is money. If we could find a way not to wait three weeks for something, we would. And if you add, if you bromate, it's sort of putting uh, sort of that you gas the flour with these chemicals, then it ages it more quickly. All that, and that, that is not a great thing to do. And actually in California, it's illegal to do it. It's not illegal in every other state. It's also illegal in Canada. I mean, there are some other states, but not all states in the United States. So I would highly recommend looking for flour that's not bromate. And then I guess in your storage, you probably won't be able to find it. Uh, flour has come a long way since then, however. And of course, there's the whole organic movement. And so using organic flour, I think, is really, really important. The man who taught us the most about baking in the early years of the bakery, his name is Michael London. He told us, he described flour as uh, insecticide-laden 
sawdust, which was very disturbing when we're just starting a bakery for him to tell us this. But I think if you use organic flour, it is not laden with insecticide. So highly recommend that you also invest in bothering to use organic flour. So that's sort of the world that artisan bakers lived in for a very long time. And I would say it's about the last decade or less in which we all started to become much more interested in whole grains and uh, in local grains and to some degree, some degree in ancient grains. Um, and we're interested in all of these because for many reasons. Number one, they have much more flour. I mean, much more flavor. Uh, they also, whole grains have much more nutrition. So grains, you know, people have been eating grains for more than 10,000 years, 14,000 years. They were an important part of our, the human diet. They have a wide range of nutrients in them and they have large quantities of fiber in them. And fiber, not having enough fiber is a big problem in the American diet. So I think it's really unfortunate that we have this idea that grains are sort of not good for you. Processed grains, highly refined grains, are what we don't want to spend a lot of time eating. But whole grains are really important for us. And, and B vitamins are mainly found in whole grains. So um, if, you, if you're baking, I highly recommend trying to figure out how to incorporate more of them into your baking. So I don't know, Ryan, maybe I got a little off topic here. Can you remind me what, was the, <laughs> what are we focusing on or why we're doing the whole grains and flour? Yeah, and, and with that combating the the movement to steer clear of carbs in general, I mean, you, you right. touched on it there with, with the vitamin B being found in whole grains. and Right, right. Well, and then, you know, I have to say, look, I'm, I'm 54 years old. I've been thinking about nutrition and weight, unfortunately, I would say, probably since I was five. I remember telling my mother or asking my mother to stop buying me short dresses because I had fat legs. Now, can you imagine that? But that's, that came out of the mouth of a five-year-old. I remember practically every diet that has existed since then, and I've been reading nutritional uh, articles uh, since I was a young teen. So I'm, I'm sorry to say that I think as Americans, we are very, have a very troubled relationship with food, and we swing very far in directions in extreme ways about eating. I think it's very, nutrition is very complicated. And so I'm of a strong component, a strong advocate of eating a balanced diet, a wide variety of things. And, and that every once in a while, when you have a treat, so if you're having, you know, you know, some fantastic dessert that has sugar and has fat in it, but you're not eating it every day, it's really not a problem. So um, I think for our daily breads, our daily pastries, eating things that have real ingredients, not a lot of preservatives, not a lot, no chemicals, and if possible, a lot of whole grains can be really healthy. And then having those special things, no matter what they're made of, of course, real ingredients, not preservatives, but once in a while, I think is, is nourishing in, a, in a, an entirely different way. So I feel pretty strongly about that after being in this, you know, in professionally in the food business for so many years and watching us swing back and forth and try to and, uh, get rid of a whole categories of food from our diet. It just doesn't work. Has the popular war on gluten impacted your business at all? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, of course, I have great uh, empathy for anyone who truly is celiac or is suffering from um, a gluten intolerance. However, if we're, if we're somebody who is not suffering from that, there is nothing problematic about gluten. It's a, it's a protein. It's just like if somebody has a shrimp allergy and I don't have a shrimp allergy, there's nothing terrible that's going to happen to me if I eat that shrimp. So somehow we got onto this thing about gluten and I, I think it's really, truly misguided. And what's unfortunate, I think, about it is that there are things that are problematic about our diet, uh, the typical American diet. And if we get distracted by these things that are not the core thing, I think we waste our time um, focused on the wrong thing. And we clearly have some issues with health and diet in our culture. And I, I really wish that we could focus on the things that are truly problematic and not sort of you know, get hung up on this, you know, this two year period, it's about fat, this period's about salt, this period, it's about refined carbohydrates, this period's about gluten. 
you know, who knows what the next one is going to be. I've actually noticed more and more how often gluten-free is stamped on some kind of bag of processed food as if that's supposed to, you know, allow us to eat the whole bag of, of whatever kind of chips it might be or, or whatever else that. Right. Right. Or an app, you know, an app or something that's clearly, you know, gluten-free anyway. Right. So sorry if that I spoke strongly about it. It's just after having been involved in food for so many years and lived through these diet changes, I um, have some pretty developed thoughts and feelings about it. I'm curious to hear more. And, and I know you, your educational background is very interesting. Business school and then uh, cooking school in, in France. When When you were studying and, and in school, were you always engaged in, in baking and in the, the science and health behind food? I think that um, for whatever reason, food has been sort of an, in just a, something that's always interested in, interested me. I remember when I was in college, I, did, I took a class, sort of a recreation community reckon ed class in cooking. And my friends were like, what is wrong with you? What are you doing taking a cooking class? And I spent a lot of time, um, instead of studying, going to the local restaurants and <laughs> tasting different things in bakeries. Um, so yes, food has always been something that's really drawn my attention. Getting a lot of questions now, Amy. The, the easiest one we'll start with is uh, Marilyn Tedesco asks if you could describe the two bread toppings uh, behind you on your, your, your background there. <laughs> You know, uh, I didn't take this picture. Someone else at the bakery did. I think one of them is um, actually whipped cream with berries on it. And the other one is avocado. And I'm not quite sure what is on that avocado. I, have, I can't quite see on my screen. I'd have to look in a different viewing. But uh, what's interesting is the bread. It's called State Street Wheat. I don't know if many of you are aware of an organization called the Bread Lab in Washington State. It's associated with Washington, uh, with the university there, and they're doing incredible work developing um, different grains that can grow in all kinds of communities across the United States because a lot of the grain is really being grown in the American West, and it became very concentrated there. It used to be grown all over the country. And with them, they worked with a variety of artisan bakers and we've started what's, uh, what we're sort of calling approachable bread. So this is soft bread, but it uh, is sliced and it can be sold in grocery stores and it has to cost less than $6 and it has to have fewer than six ingredients in it. So if you go and you look at bread in a lot of grocery stores that's in plastic, there, they have many, many, a long list of ingredients. And so this is an effort to get good and nurturing food to uh, people who maybe wouldn't think of going to an artisan bakery. It's sort of more approachable or appealing because it's soft, while a lot of bread in the bakeries that people call artisan is you know, very crusty. It's already sliced, which is bread that you know, many people are sort of used to dealing with rather than bread that requires them to have a, you know, a certain nice serrated knife to use. And, uh, uh, and the flavor profile, it's not particularly sour. So it's a project that's going on with a variety of artisan bakers across the country. And for every loaf that we sell, we all make a donation uh, back to the Bread Lab to support their work. Nice, that's great. Uh, one of our home bakers asks, what other traditional grains do you suggest uh, people can try out? Well, a lot of people are really interested in something that's called einkorn. I don't know if any of you know what einkorn is, but it's one of the, it's supposed to be sort of the original, the, the mother of all wheat. So it's one of the most, uh, or the most ancient form of wheat. Uh, it is nice to use main, in making scones or shortbread cookies. It doesn't make bread incredibly well because it doesn't have a lot of the great kind of protein that gives strong gluten. It does have a lot of protein in it. It's quite nutritious, but not all proteins uh, work in the same way. So that would be an interesting one. Uh, another interesting um, grain to use is spelt, uh, which is on another form of wheat. Uh, and I also think that if people baked with rye a little bit more, you can use it obviously in bread, but you can make 
uh, shortbread cookies. You can make pie crust out of it. You, it's, you'll often see it online in recipes uh, with chocolate. So like brownies made with rye flour. Uh, rye, sometimes people get confused and they think because rye, Jewish rye bread in particular, often has ground caraway in it, that rye has a strong flavor, but it doesn't. It's actually quite sweet and mild. So you might enjoy trying, um, playing around with rye and substituting it in recipes also. Are many of these recipes in the cookbook that came out a few years ago? No. So that, that cookbook was sort of to commemorate the first 25 years of the bakery. And uh, we hadn't started to go in this direction yet. And so since then, we've started to change some of those recipes and use different, uh, different grains in it and freshly milled grains and whole grain. So maybe, maybe in the next book, in another 20 years, we'll publish those recipes. You shared with me a chocolate chip cookie recipe from that book. And there was the, I think it was the soft red wheat flour. Mm -hmm. And then another very specific wheat flour. Can you talk about the nuances of those flours? Sure. Well, it's just amazing. I think that We've all learned in the world of chocolate and in the world of say apples, that there's an incredible range of different kinds of chocolates that, and if they come from different places, they taste different. We certainly knew this about wine. And we, uh, if you look at all the hair heirloom apples, there are all kinds of different varieties. And the same is true with um, flowers, wheat, different versions of wheat. So some are, there's, you know, they have some funny names like Turkey red is one of them. And each one is really unique unto itself and has a slightly different flavor profile. And it has different levels of protein in it. And so it can be what's called hard red or soft red or soft white. And the red or the white is referring to the color of the bran. And the hard means how much protein is in it. So harder is higher protein, soft is less protein. And so you would use like soft white wheat would be better for pastry making. Hard red wheat is the kind of wheat that is generally used for bread baking. And then you might see, you know, different names like turkey red and you'll wonder what is that? Well, or Sonora is another one. I mean, there are all kinds of them. And I think we'll all start to see them more in the stores and hear about them more from other food people. And they have different flavor profiles just like different chocolates do or different grapes do. And it's a little hard for me to tell you exactly what they taste like. Uh, I haven't quite, I'm not sure any of us have quite developed the, the vocabulary, different levels of nuttiness, um, different levels of bitterness. So they, they, it's really interesting. There will be mustachioed grain tasters in the future though. You know, <laughs> exactly. Now that yeah. it's been identified as a potential business. <laughs> you, you think it's, it's the education component that is lacking as to why conventionally we, we as Americans don't know of the different grains, um, of the different flours, or is it just more of right now, it, it's the baker's secret and we as consumers eat the fresh baked goods and enjoy them, but just don't really care too much, don't, lack the curiosity as to what's in there. No, I think it, it is a relatively new thing that even the bakers are becoming involved in. You know, it used to be in the 1800s, every single community grew its own grain and they, every community had its own mill. There used to be thousands and thousands of mills in the United States. A community didn't exist unless it had its own mill because people, grain was such a big component of people's diets. Um, I have, I have it here, yeah, some data. So in 1860, there were 14,000 grain mills in the United States. In 1880, so 20 years later, there were 10,000 more. There were 24,000. And then there was a big, big change in technology. Roller mills uh, were created instead of these stone mills, which are also called grist mills. And from 1880 to 1890, we went from 24,000 mills to 219 because the mills could be so much more productive. Now in the United States, there's just been huge consolidation. So in the consolidation of the mills, we also had the consolidation of the agriculture. And when we had consolidation of the agriculture, we also started to limit what kind of grain we grew and it became many, many fewer varieties. And they were varieties that were developed uh, in order to have incredible um, output volume. 
you know, I, some of you may remember, it was a big thing in the 70s to grow enough grain to kind of feed the world. So it came out of a good place. But what happened was, as we got more industrialized in the agriculture and in the milling, many of us sort of lost any knowledge about really what was flour, where did flour come from? What is, a, you know, what is this? What does a wheat berry look like? What are the components? Many of us, I, you know, me included and many artists and bakers, even 20 years ago, we weren't very engaged with that. You know, flour is what you could get in the grocery store. And we had the idea that it was all the same. So it was, it's just a continuing interest in getting better and learning more that uh, bakers and farmers are sort of investigating um, different forms of wheat and other grains. Uh, and now as we start to use them, we're starting to educate other people like all of you. And so you're hearing this talk tonight, if you hadn't known it before, then I think you'll start to notice things in your community and your stores and online. And I imagine, you know, your, your knowledge um, will continue to grow. So I think it, it's actually a relatively new thing that we're all talking about. Has that evolution accelerated lately? It sounds like from what you're saying that it has, that the last five years you've Definitely. And there were absolutely. And there, you know, the, it really started um, the green markets in New York City. Uh, there were, uh, and they noticed that they, you know, they were demanding a certain amount of local agriculture in for anyone to come to those green markets, but the bakers were allowed to do whatever they wanted. So it didn't matter where any of their ingredients came from. And then they started to think, well, this doesn't make sense. This is a green market. This is a farmer's market. The baker should be held to some level of accountability for using local food. And so because of their interest in that, then people started growing it, then people started to use it. And so we really have to um, thank uh, some of the wonderful people. It, it's called Grow New York NYC, who kind of started this movement about 10 years ago. And, you know, then people are interested, they talk to one another, and it's continuing to evolve around the country. So we, we have a question that feeds in nicely with that from Ilana Miller, the aptly named Ms. Miller for tonight's event. Uh, she asks about Ezekiel bread and the other sprouted grain bread. What mm -hmm. does that really mean? Is it good marketing mm -hmm. or is there some nutritional value behind it as well? Well, you know, I think that many of us don't really know. And so what it means is that you actually allow the wheat berry or the grain berry to sprout, and then you dry it, and then you grind it, you mill it. And there's some, I, some people think that there's more nutrition. I've spoken to some people who actually, some millers who actually make it, and they say they don't know that there's more nutrition, but they do believe that maybe it's a little easier for people to digest. Uh, so I am not I don't know. I'm not actually a scientist. I haven't done the studies, but that's, that's what I do know. Of. That's what I've heard about it. And you talk about grinding your own flour at home. Sure. I mean, now if you go online, you can find mills that you can buy that I am super excited about, uh, about uh, the possibility of people grinding their own flour at home. One company that I particularly love is called mock mill, M O C K M I L L. You can also go to an online company called Breadtopia. Um, they have mills available. A mill won't take up any more space in your kitchen than say a Cuisinart just, or a coffee maker. They're about that big. And uh, milling your own grain is just like grinding your own coffee. So if any of you are into coffee enough that you grind your own coffee beans every day, uh, you can buy all kinds of different grains in their berry form. And when, then when you go to bake, you just, you know, you take a cup of grain, you put it at the top of this machine, you learn a little bit about exactly how you want to mill it in your machine. Some of them are very simple and they just have a few settings and you choose the setting. Some of them are a little more complicated. They actually have stones and you learn exactly um, how to adjust those stones so that you get the grind that you want. And in literally in, you know, in two minutes, you've freshly milled grain for whatever you're making. And it's amazing to me that the, the smell of that freshly milled grain is, the aroma is so much stronger than any flour that we can buy in a store. And, you know, 80% of our sense of smell, our sense of taste is our sense of smell. And so I believe that, you know, it truly adds um, flavor to anything that we're making. So you're making a simple pancake 
and you grind your own flour for it, it takes that pancake from, you know, a good one, a seven or an eight to a nine or 10. And it's very easy to do. It also, the, when you're freshly milling it, there more of the nutrients are in it. Um, the grain is more alive, so it's good for us. Um, and it, I think it's just a fun thing to do if you have children in your family to educate them about the food. So many, many reasons to do it and very easy to do. This is so exciting, Amy, and you helped me out because while you were answering, I was wondering, am I going to discuss this with my wife first or just order it and let her know once, <laughs> once I open the box? But now I can, I can use the children as my pawns and, and we've got it all taken care of. Well, I think it can be a really interesting science experiment for them to do a lot of things. You know, you could sprout them um, just to see what happens. You can mill them. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you can mill different ones. You can make sure with the same recipe out of different grains and see exactly how they taste that's different. You can make a gluten ball. Has anyone ever done that? It's, it's super fun. So, you know, sometimes this idea of gluten is this mysterious thing. Well, it actually, you can, if you just take flour and water, take a cup of flour, you know, put in a quarter cup of water, knead it into a little piece of dough, then put it in a bowl with water. And then you rub the ball and you'll see that the starch comes off it and you, you end up with cloudy water. So you dump the water out, get fresh water. You keep going, you rub it and you rub it. It's like washing this thing. And in the end, you'll end up with this slightly gray green sort of mucusy looking material and that is gluten so that's also another really fun thing to do with um, kids i haven't done this but i was told that if you take that gluten ball and you put it in the microwave but you should look this up online because i'm sure you can find it that it actually sort of balloons out so that is also a fun thing that you could do with kids this is great we might have to sign you up to to do a virtual <laughs> camp for us at the, at the JCC. <laughs> okay. I'll be there. A uh, question that sounds like it should come with a punchline. What's the big deal about King Arthur flower? Oh, that's so interesting. So King Arthur is a really wonderful, wonderful company, super socially responsible. They're employee owned. There's this category of companies that you can, um, you have to go through a long process called B companies. They're also a B company. You can't be a B company unless you're incredibly socially responsible. Um, what's fascinating about King Arthur is that um, they don't actually mill their own flour. So they have flour milled for them by all kinds of different millers all over the country. But what they do for all of us is that they make sure that the flour that's in those bags is very consistent and up to their specs. So you can really rely on the flour that they um, put their name on. So for years and years in the bakery, I'd say the first 12 years of our history, we only bought um, King Arthur flour because we, you know, they educated us a lot and we could really rely on the consistency of that flour. Um, so that's, that's what's good about it. But there are other companies that are good also, um, and they may not be quite as socially responsible as King Arthur is. All right. Uh, question going back to your classes you've been offering, the online classes, are they available in some sort of archival uh, vault or is it? We gone? have not recorded them yet. That's sort of next on the line to decide whether we want to do that and put them out. Okay. Yeah, you've really, you've run the gamut of, of a variety of baking uh, ideas and, and practices tonight. Any simple advice for the, the more novice baker and then we can shift and go into a, a, maybe a more advanced play for, for people who are looking to, to up their game right now? Sure, yeah. Well, I would say um, even when making something really simple. So if you're a novice baker and you're making something simple, it can taste much, much better if you use really great ingredients. So, uh, you know, buy good butter. Um, buy, we love a, a brown sugar that's called Muscovado brown sugar. If you can find that in the grocery store, it has a lot more flavor than sort of simple American brown sugar use real vanilla extract. So you can, I, I am a firm believer that things don't have to be complicated to be wonderful. 
that often one of the most, some of the most wonderful things are the simple things, and they can be even more fantastic if we just use really, really great ingredients. So that's one bit of advice. Another is um, follow the, if it's the first time you're making a recipe, I highly recommend following the recipe as it's written. I know maybe, I don't know if it's like an American thing, but we always wanna do something a little bit different or, oh, could that be right? I love that when we're teaching a class and the student says, are you sure? <laughs> like, yeah, we're sure, that's why we're telling you. Um, so if it's written, now not all recipes are fantastic, but it's even my rule to follow the recipe as it's written the first time. And then after that, maybe adjust the recipe. And then one final, um, tip that we always teach is it, it's really much more accurate to use a scale than to use volume measures. Now, not all recipes are in weights, but if you have a recipe that's in weights or you have a good conversion chart, we highly recommend weighing your ingredients. Often people say to us, you know, I made this one day and it was great and the next day I made it and it wasn't so great. Well, a couple of things could happen. Sometimes we don't measure exactly the same way. You know, it depends on how long, say, flour or sugar has been sitting somewhere or how much moisture is in it because of the season. And so you don't get the actual same amount when you're doing volume measures. Another thing that happens is sometimes we make mistakes when we measure. So we also teach, it, although it seems maybe a, like a lot of work, measure out everything before you start the recipe and then double check it as you're putting it in. Because I don't know how many of you have done this, but I have certainly done it many times that I you know, I was doubling a recipe and I doubled two thirds of the ingredients and I forgot to double the other ones. Well, if I had measured them all out and double checked it, I would have caught that mistake. So that, I hope those are helpful to people. Those are great. And we've got a couple more questions for you that are coming in. Uh, one from Judy Chapnick, who uh, in addition to the question says the University of Michigan students miss Zingerman's. Uh, what do you think of cup for cup flour? Gosh, I am not, uh, I don't know cup for cup flour. Okay, well, we don't. Tell me about it. I, I, will, I will see if Judy has a little more to say. And in the meantime, uh, she also wonders, is Zingerman sold anywhere but in Ann Arbor? Well, many Zingerman's products are sold through Zingerman's mail order. Um, so you can go to zingermans.com and you can have things shipped to you. But we don't sell um, out. We don't really sell outside of Ann Arbor beyond, besides Zingerman's mail order. One of the parts of the whole Zingerman's community, our vision is to be local and to stay in the community and to not grow beyond it. Um, I, we have this idea that we are who we are very much because of our interaction with our particular community. And um, we want to be able to give back to the community. And so we we uh, prefer to live in the community where we're working. And then we teach many of the things that we do to other people in the business world and encourage them to kind of do similar things that we do. We give our recipes away and teach a lot of our business practices so that they can, you know, create uh, businesses that are like ours in their community. That's a little bit different. That matches, that matches the world that they're living in. I'm going to see if Judy wants to clarify her question. In the meantime, though, uh, we do have a quick poll while we're waiting. Um, see who has been doing some baking during this time. So feel free to respond. Judy, um, cup for cup is gluten free and the measurement is the same. She said she hasn't used it, but friends swear by it. Hmm. I think the best thing is just to try a simple recipe with it and see how you like it. Yeah, I'm not aware of it. Okay, a uh, couple more. Uh, Karen says, uh, Karen's excited about your, your growth of the milling, of the in-house milling of flowers. Uh, she's purchased the Michigan soft red wheat flour from you and she was wondering if you had a recommendation of what it would be best used for. I think um, it could make a really great biscuit. It could be a really nice addition to a loaf of bread, maybe not all of the flour, I would, you know, 30% of the flour in any bread recipe that you have, it would be really good in. Very nice. We made a nice baguette out of it. It's pretty versatile. That's great. Thank you. Uh, final question from Brian Kranzler. How does baking in a convection oven change how the recipe comes out? 
Well, so convection ovens, if any, for those of you who don't know, are just ovens that have a fan blowing in them and it uh, makes it uh, feel like it's hotter in there, just like if you were, you know, outside and you have the wind blowing and it's very hot or wind chill if it's very cold, which is more common here in Michigan than being too hot. Um, and so for for things like um, croissant or cinnamon rolls, a convection oven is really, really great. It helps them get sort of a, a bigger lift or a jump in the oven. And I like that very much. And I often find that convection ovens give better browning to pastries than a conventional oven. That said, you know, making a cookie or a pie, it really doesn't make much of a difference between the two. Um, in terms of bread baking though, we always recommend that you do not use a convection oven. What, when you're baking bread in a convection oven, the uh, blowing air dries out the uh, outside of the bread often before all the yeast has sort of given up, uh, all of, produced all of its carbon dioxide and gotten the whole lift of the bread. And so what happens is you have this tight exterior that constricts the bread and you don't get the nice whole development in it. So it's better if you have a choice to always use the conventional settings. Uh, when you're baking bread in your oven. Thank you, Amy. And I know you're in Michigan. It's nearing 10 o'clock. Uh, we appreciate your time. I want to let you, let you go before it gets too late. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight. Amy, this was really great. I think um, the volume of questions show how excited everybody was and, and how uh, passionately baking many of us mm -hmm. are at home right now. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you to the underwriters of our 2019-2020 Arts and Ideas season. Uh, their support's allowing us to continue to program even while we are, we are at home. Uh, everyone, be safe, please. I uh, look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you again, Amy. Yeah, thank you. It was fun. Stay safe.